show. That's fun. I'd watch that on a regular basis. Uh, hi, my name is Cassie Fair, and if we haven't met, uh, my husband Alex and I get to lead this community together. We're so glad to have you here. Uh, so many fun things happening in the life of our community and our church and even in this city over the next couple of days and weeks. I'm so excited for the game today. So stoked. Um, it's going to be great, I hope. Or nobody will talk about it next week. One of the two. And it'll just be like silent. Nobody acknowledges. Um, well, today I will be talking a little bit about prophecy, as mentioned in our scripture reading. But before we get there, I actually just simply want to talk about communication. And I feel kind of qualified to talk about this because obviously, yes, I'm a, I'm a pastor, but I also got my master's in communication and I teach public speaking at University of Missouri, Kansas City. Go Roos. Yes, our mascot is a kangaroo. So great. Um, so anyway, uh, every single semester when I start up with my students, one of the first things that we talk about is how messy communication is. So effectively what I'm trying to do is help my, under my students understand that there's a problem that public speaking can work to solve, right? We don't like to learn things that we feel like are like a no-brainer or don't matter to our life. And so I always start every semester saying, communication is really messy. And here's why. There's this lovely little thing called the communication process. And although it sounds super simple, we all know it's not, there is a sender of a message, an actual message, number two, and then three, there's a receiver. And communication gets really, really tricky because oftentimes the way in which we communicate a message is not the same way that somebody receives it. It has to do with our worldviews, our context, our upbringing, all of those things. This is that math teacher that you could not understand in elementary school. That was me. This is the argument that you have with your spouse simply because you were miscommunicating. You were missing each other. This is that supervisor that you can't seem to please because you just never understand what they're asking you to do. And then the other reason why communication is so messy is because of this little thing we like to call noise. Noise can be quite literal noise, like the ambulance that comes down the street here in a few moments. I'm sure it will, because it seems to always when we have church. Or the squeaky door in the back of the sanctuary, because they just painted and didn't replace all the nails, okay? It can also be like physiological noise, like I'm really hungry. I didn't eat breakfast. And so the way that I communicate something to you or the way that you receive it is affected because of that physiological noise. It can also be psychological noise, like I walked in here feeling really, really anxious, or like church isn't really a very comfortable space for me, or whatever that looks like. All of these different types of noises affect our communication and make things really messy. And yet, schools, teachers, trainers, supervisors, practitioners, and even me, <laughs> We all work really, really, really hard to get better at this. And the reason why is because communication is worth it. It's that brilliantly crafted story that brings you to tears or that beautifully placed word that just moves your heart. It's that impassioned TED talk that makes you change something about your life. Or it's those loving words from a parent or a mentor that imbues you with meaning and purpose in life. And so we keep on trying to communicate and we keep on messing up because although communication is messy, communication is worth it. Communication at its very essence is the conduit of love. And in the biblical narrative, there's actually a word for this particular type of communication or message, and that word is prophecy. It's the communication of God's love to other people. And so today, I would like to make a case for prophecy and why, much like communication, yes, it's super messy, but that it's worth it. 
So to kind of set us up here, we've been in a sermon series called Come Holy Spirit. And we've been working to establish or move towards the following goals. One, that we would move beyond information into an experience with God. Knowledge is so great, but it's not enough. Two, we want to encounter God in the ordinary, everyday aspects of our life. God will cease, told you. Right? There it is. Noise. You lost contact, like, for two seconds. Yeah. Number two, <laughs> we want to encounter God in the ordinary. If we don't encounter God in just the ordinary, everyday aspects of life, right, he doesn't seem to be relevant. We want to radically open ourselves up to God. Like, maybe he's doing something different or special or something that makes you turn your head. And lastly, we want to do the Jesus stuff. We say we want to do the very things Jesus does, except, right, some of the more weird ones. And so we spent the last several months serving the Old Testament and the New Testament, specifically studying that person of the Holy Spirit, as this individual is so often forgotten in our church spaces. And now as we enter this new year, we're specifically focusing on those gifts, right? The things that we stereotypically think about when we hear the words Holy Spirit. And we're going to discern specifically what the gift of prophecy is today and what that looks like in our lives. So I'm going to break this down into three parts. Part one, prophecy biblically. Part two, prophecy defined. And part three, prophecy now. So let's start. Number one, prophecy biblically. We learned this past fall in Genesis chapter one that God used his ruach, which is the Greek word, or excuse me, the Hebrew word for breath or spirit, to create all things from chaos. We learned specifically that God breathed that breath or that spirit into our very lungs and created us. But then, in Genesis chapter 3, sin steals that breath, God's spirit from us, and we choose to become our own gods. And this brings us to the history of Israel where we are confronted time and time and time again with humanity's propensity to miss the mark. But thankfully, God keeps on speaking. He keeps on creating through his spirit, his ruach, to a chosen people, people called Israel. And in Numbers chapter 11, a passage that Alex spent a lot of time on this past fall, we see a man named Moses who's been chosen by God to lead the people of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. And frequently, Moses would hear from God, usually in the form of a cloud, and he would get these words from God and then impart them on to the people. But in Numbers chapter 11, verse 25, we see something very unique happen. The spirit or God's words are given to more than just the person of Moses. His ruach, his breath, his spirit is given to 70 elders. Let's look at it. Moses says in verse 25, then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it in the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they, what, prophesied. But they did not continue doing it. Really weird ending to that story. But there's a purpose. So these elders receive God's spirit, and it says they prophesy, they speak, they create, they breathe. But then it says the words of God stop. In other words, this gift is not ongoing. It's temporary. And this is what leads Moses to cry out in Numbers chapter 11, verse 29. Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets. And that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Moses realizes in this moment that his experience of God's personal presence is not the rule, but rather an exception. And Moses longs for a day in which all people are to experience the God of all gods in the same way that he does. 
in the same way the, all the other prophets in the Old Testament do. He desires God's presence, God's gift, his spirit, his words, his breath to no longer be temporary, but to be permanent. And this brings us to the person of Jesus. The person who became the very spoken word of God in human form, John chapter 1. He is walking, talking, breathing prophecy. And after his death and resurrection, he appears to the disciples in John chapter 20, verse 22, and says this. And with that, he breathed his spirit on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Or in other words, here is my breath for your lungs, my ruach, my spirit. The creation relationship has once again been made available to all. God's words are now here for you. And we see this actually come to pass in the book of Acts when on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is given to all as Jesus promised, and they began speaking words of God. This is what Peter explains in his sermon in Acts chapter 2 when he quotes the prophet Joel saying this, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And if we were to keep reading in the book of Acts, we would see that these events in Acts 2 are not a one-off. They're normative, and they continue to happen with increase as the church grows. In other words, Moses' wishes have been fulfilled. All God's people have become prophets because the Lord has placed his spirit in them. What was once only available to the prophets in the Old Testament has become available to all in the New Testament. And that is why we continue to use the word prophecy even today. It's an ordinary practice that was once extraordinary before the spirit of Jesus breathed on us. So here is the big idea. Prophecy is not an optional subpoint of the Bible. It sits at the very center of the biblical story, of my story, and of your story. And so the question remains, what exactly is it? <laughs> if I were you, that's what I'd be thinking in this moment. What exactly is prophecy? Is prophecy God's voice? Is that it? Is it being able to predict something that hasn't happened yet, like a fortune teller or a magic eight ball? Shake it around a little bit and get a result. Is it knowing something about someone that you couldn't have known previously? Is it being able to understand and interpret the scriptures? Is it giving a word of encouragement to someone when they really need it? And I hope that you've come to the answer that I'm wanting you to get to, and that is yes. All of the above. Prophecy simply is hearing and speaking God's voice on behalf of an individual or group. Prophecy is simply hearing and speaking God's voice on behalf of an individual or group. N.T. Wright, a uh, pastor and scholar, says it this way. This is a very academic definition for you. Prophecy is the activity through which particular words are given to particular individuals or group by people speaking in church and claiming that the Spirit is leading them to say such things or that Jesus himself is speaking these words. Similarly, Craig Keener, I think he says it a little more succinctly, says prophecy involves God speaking to or through a servant who listens to his voice. So prophecy can be to an individual or it can be to a group. It can be to challenge an injustice like in the book of Amos or it can be to encourage the church as we see in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Prophecy can be something revelatory like a word of knowledge or wisdom or it can be something totally ordinary, very simple. And this is why 
I'm preaching this sermon today. <laughs> because prophecy can be hard to define succinctly. And so, to gain further clarity, I want to look at that passage that we just read earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So, if you want to turn there, if you want to scroll there on your phone using that guide, you're welcome to. It'll also be on the screen. Alex mentioned much of this context last week, but if you weren't here, I just want to briefly recap what we're looking, about, looking at in this particular passage. So Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he's addressing their disorderly worship. He's addressing their disorderly worship. So people are having these very powerful experiences with God, which is great. But the problem is, is they're praying out loud very loudly in other languages, heavenly or real. We don't know exactly what that looked like. But then there are also other individuals that are actually interrupting and speaking over them. So this is a very loud, chaotic, distracting environment. And the problem is, is it's keeping first-time visitors from hearing the gospel for the first time. That's a problem. So if you've never heard that that's a problem, that's a problem. It's actually in the Bible. Paul says it. So you can feel good about that. That is a problem. When disorderly worship is leading to people not being able to engage with Christianity or the gospel. And so Paul in these verses is saying that unlearned languages, although they help in personal times of prayer, tongues, they do not actually help people come to know God in a corporate setting. But prophecy or the gift of speaking on behalf of God to a community, that does. It builds up the church. So as we head into this passage, I want to point out one more thing, and that is that we are vastly different from the Corinthian church. This community right here, very different than the Corinthian church. None of us are speaking into the mic or interrupting me while I teach. We're not using these gifts to puff ourselves up. As Alex mentioned last week, our temptation is not towards wild gatherings. It is towards lifeless ones. And so we we approach this passage today, acknowledge our context being vastly different than that of the Corinthian church. Let's read. Verse 1, Paul writes this. Pursue love. And earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Some translations say eagerly. They both kind of mean the same thing here. Especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue or an unlearned language speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, verse 3, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding, their encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. In a sense, don't be puffed up. Don't let your pride invade these gatherings. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. So a few things to notice about this passage. First one, Paul says in this letter, he starts by saying, pursue love and eagerly desire the gifts that you may what? Prophesy. Key words here, pursue love. The instructions here imply that others will feel love as a result of prophecy and that in your pursuit of God or the very embodiment of love itself, you will prophesy. In other words, prophecy is the translation or the communication of God's love for other people. Prophecy is to speak love from the giver of love. And this is likely what Paul meant when he wrote in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Prophecy moves things from our heads into our hearts. 
It helps us move from an abstract like God loves me to the experience of being loved and seen by God. It's saying, Amanda, God loves the courage and humor and ease for which you've navigated the difficult seasons of life in the last couple years. It's saying to Jared, God loves the simple, settled, and easy posture by which you lead and serve others. It's me saying to Alex, I get the sense that you've been avoiding a particular situation, Enneagram 9. I could be wrong, (laughs) but I think you may need to take a step towards love. This is me saying, Midtown Church, I get the sense that we could better serve the homeless and displaced in our community. We could turn our excess into gifts of love. It's one thing to say God loves you. It's another to inject that into the details of our very life. And if you're sitting here thinking, it cannot be that easy. Like, there is no way prophecy is that simple. Let me assure you, it really is. This is likely why Paul says prophecy should strengthen, encourage, comfort, edify, upbuild the people of the church. Secondly, Paul says that we should earnestly or eagerly seek the gifts, especially prophecy. The Greek word used here is zelo. I think I said that right. Uh, And it's to set one's heart on or to deeply commit to something. So set your heart on the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Or be deeply committed to the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Paul's not instructing us or the individuals in this church to manufacture an experience, to create some sort of hype, to be inauthentic. No, he wants them to earnestly set their hearts on hearing God's voice for other people. And likewise for us today. So for those who may be sitting here pretty ambivalent about the spiritual practice, like a take it or leave it posture that says if God wants to do something, he will, right? I want you to heed Paul's words here. Because this type of ambivalence is directly at odds with what Paul is instructing us to do here. He says earnestly, not passively, earnestly, Seek the gifts, especially prophecy. I think that the modern day church doesn't eagerly desire prophecy as much as we eagerly desire teaching. And although teaching is so important, like you guys know, we have a high bar for teaching in this community. Unfortunately, this has led to a misconception that the most important words spoken today are mine. And the problem with that is the most important words spoken today are not mine, they're yours. And if we really believed that, we would earnestly desire prophecy. And this leads us to our last point for today, prophecy now, or how do we do this thing? What does it look like? Much like the communication process, what I'm about to tell you is not revolutionary. Like, I do not have some golden nugget of wisdom that's brand new. It's not rocket science, but it is super, super messy. Many are sick and tired of the ways that prophecy has been used and abused in recent years. God's voice has undoubtedly been claimed falsely by many in shocking and even scandalous ways. And I find myself wary and even skeptical of so-called prophets and prophecies. We actually talked about this a little bit in Microchurch this week. We grappled with this reality, the struggle of the question, like, is it worth it? Like, are spiritual gifts worth the potential of getting it wrong or associating ourselves with that group? That's a real fear. And I guess my goal or my aim today is to say, I really think that it's worth it. 
that much like communication, prophecy can be so messy, but it comes at an immeasurable reward because it is the conduit of God's love to other people. It's that perfectly timed encouragement for a friend when you so desperately needed it to get through that day. It's that reminder that God sees you and loves you enough to go out of his way to speak to you through someone else. It's that wisdom of a microchurch leader who confirms God's call on your life or that decision that you've made. We cannot, myself included, let the skepticism or fear around prophecy or getting it wrong or being associated with those people keep us from this really, really important gift. And so with that, let's dig into how we do it. Again, this is not rocket science. In fact, you're probably going to be underwhelmed by this. But prophecy is simply hearing, giving, receiving. Hearing, giving, receiving. So first, to start hearing. We start by actually having to hear the voice of God. And contrary to many charismatic settings, hearing God's voice does not often or always happen in the chaotic, the loud, but in the quiet, the stillness, and in the waiting. This is a pattern that I actually see, think we see in the life of Jesus as he goes off alone to pray often. We see this in John chapter 5, verse 16. It says, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Matthew chapter 14, verse 23 says, and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to what? Pray. We learn in Luke chapter 22, verse 30, 39, that it was Jesus' custom to regularly go to the Mount of Olives to pray. In other words, Jesus had a prayer chair, or rather like a prayer patch of grass. It's more like it. I think we're tempted to think that Jesus' ability to prophesy, to heal, to perform miracles solely resulted from his divine parentage. But I want to argue today that I think his times of prayer actually pray, played a really big role. I think those moments of quiet and stillness made all the difference. Maybe some of you today are not experiencing the gift of prophecy or the gifts, period, because you're not creating space to hear from God. You're not regularly asking him to reveal words to you not just for yourself, but for others as well. And this is not a moment of judgment or condemnation. Believe me, I'm preaching this sermon to myself. But my encouragement today is to make space to listen, to hear God's voice, to open yourself up to the possibility that he might use you to speak to others. And as you learn to create space and tune into that still, small voice, I think you'll discover how ordinary the Spirit's whisper really is. You might get a sense that you should ask someone how they're doing. The Spirit may speak in a gentle nudge to you to encourage that coworker who just completed a project. The Spirit might give you a picture of a friend in crisis and simply give you the prophetic question, are you okay? The spirit may bring an out of ordinary detail or description to your mind about a person in your microchurch and ask you to ask them about it. The spirit may also be prompting you to challenge a policy or pattern in your workplace because of the way that it affects other people. We usually use the verb here, and I, I did it here as well, but often it's more like a sense or a feeling, an instinct, or maybe even your gut. I'm not saying that your subconscious, your weird ideas, or your imagination are all God's spirit. Please hear me out. Sometimes you just have indigestion. Sometimes you just had a bad night's sleep. But I am saying that we should open ourselves up to the possibility that, thing, that there are things that God might be trying to communicate to us for the sake of other people. 
There's an author and pastor, his name is Pete Gregg, and he co-wrote a book with John Mark Comer called Hearing the Voice of God. And he gives this really, I'm about to do it, cheesy acronym, okay? So here I am, pastor, giving the cheesy acronym. I know, it's the worst. But it's really easy to remember, and I think it's really helpful. So every time we hear something or we think we sense something, it's a really good idea to run it through a filter. And the filter that Pete uses is what he calls the ABC filter. Told you, easy to remember, A, B, C. A is affirming. This is asking yourself the question, does this word fulfill the criteria of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, right? Is it strengthening? Is it encouraging? Is it comforting? Is it edifying? Is it upbuilding? B, biblical. Is this word consistent with the broad teachings and witness of the scripture and most, most importantly, Jesus, right, who reveals the scriptures to us? This is not taking a scripture verse out of context. Sometimes delivering prophecy requires hard work. Or patience. You don't have to give it immediately, okay? So A, affir affirming. B, biblical. And C, Christ-like. Is this word consistent with the character, mission, and message of Jesus? So when we hear or sense something, we need to pass it through this filter. And if it meets the mark, we then deliver the prophecy. I hadn't planned on sharing this example, but as I was thinking and praying yesterday, I was like, oh, I need you. This is a good one. So some of you guys know this. Alex and I are currently in the foster to adopt process right now. Some of that has resulted from our um, just struggles to have biological kids. And so I've actually had a whole lot of help and love from the person of Jesus and people in this community. It hasn't been nearly as hard as I think it probably should be or could be. Uh, but everybody has their moments. And I was having one of these moments back around Christmas time where I was just thinking through all the what ifs, right, or could be's, or I wish X, Y, and Z. And as I was praying through this, I felt God nudge me, the Holy Spirit nudge me, and say, if you feel like this, all the other individuals in your life that are struggling with infertility likely feel this way too. You need to text some people. So I hopped on my phone, and I worked to start creating a message that I sent out to several individuals in this community in my own personal life who are struggling with having biological kids. And as I was writing through that message, I'm thinking through, does this affirm them? Like, does this show love to them? Yes. Is this biblical? Yes, it shows in the Bible over and over and over again, right, that God meets us at our deepest and darkest places, that he's there for us when we don't understand, when we're frustrated, when we're feeling doubt, and see is this Christ-like? Absolutely, right? Jesus consistently chose to meet people in their hours of desperation, of need, even when they didn't want him. And so I sent the text. When we receive or we sense words from God, we need to pass them through a test. And this is one of the ways that we ensure that we're not abusing the gift of prophecy. And this leads into our second step for today, which is giving. Giving. So if prophecy is both hearing and speaking, right, that means we actually have to speak or give that thing to another individual. And this is where things become terrifying and go horribly wrong, the delivery, right? This is it. This is where it goes wrong. And the key word that I want to emphasize to you today in all of this is humility, Prophecy is often used by those who say, God said to me, which I think we can all agree is a generally unhelpful statement. It's just not helpful. In fact, I think many of us are weary of prophecy because of phrases like this that assume so much ego and pride. And so let me suggest today maybe an alternative or a better approach. I was thinking about you the other, the other day, and I just got this sense that Fill in the blank. This could be totally out of left field, so please feel free to disregard this if this is not right. But I'm feeling like maybe you're struggling with blank. Please ignore this if this is not the case, if this doesn't make sense. But I just, I thought maybe that I should share with you. 
if this is really from God, right, if these prophecies, these words that you're receiving, these senses, these nudges, your gut, whatever it is, if it's really from God, a humble disclaimer will not make a difference. But if it isn't, you're giving the permission to the recipient to disregard it. Say, eh, I don't think that was for me. I don't know if that's right. So another quick example of this. Um, my mom is an extremely incredible woman of God. If anybody knows her in this room, you know that to be the case. She always says the right thing at the right time. And I'm like, I don't know how. Teach me. Uh, but we were at a conference together not too long ago. And she, we were in a time of worship. She stepped out in the aisle and spoke to this woman on the other side of the room. And, um, you know, she came back, whatever. And later I'm questioning her about it because I didn't know this woman at all. I'm like, did you know her? We're in Florida. I'm like, who do you know in Florida? Uh, and she's like, yeah, you know, I was worshiping. And I just, like, had this sense that there was, like, this blue color that I needed to ask this woman about. So I was just like, okay, I'll go ask her about it. And so my mom went up to this woman. She asked her about this, like, blue color. And this woman's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And my mom's like, okay, cool. I probably got this one wrong. But regardless, I just feel like God wants you to know that he loves you a lot. That was it. Did my mom get it wrong? Maybe. Probably. I don't know. But the point is that she approached it with humility and she translated God's love to this woman. And this leads me to my last point, and that's receiving. If prophecy is to be given, then there will inevitably be a receiver. And so we have to learn not just what it's like to give words of prophecy, but we have to le learn how to receive them as well. Paul teaches about this very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. And he says that we actually have to filter prophecies with discernment and discretion. He actually says people are going to get it really wrong. And even when they get it right, they're probably still going to get something wrong. That's what Paul says. And so as a receiver, we actually have to weigh prophecy. Paul talks about this later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 29. We can't accept everything we hear. People are going to get it wrong. We have to examine prophecy in light of scripture and maybe even with a trusted friend, Jesus follower, microchurch leader, mentor, whatever it is. So if someone says to you tomorrow, you're getting a million dollars. God told me. Okay. We're going to run it through the ABCs. Although that might be affirming, it is. <laughs> like, who doesn't want a million dollars? That's good. It is not biblical. Jesus over and over and over and over again says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The poor shall inherit the kingdom of earth. He never promises us wealth and riches here on this earth. I really think that this community is mature enough to be open to hearing God's voice through other people without fear or crumbling if someone misses the mark. And this does inevitably mean that we're going to have to have a whole lot of grace for people, that we're going to have to let people fail. We're going to have to let them mess up. We're going to have to let them get it totally wrong. But much like Moses in Numbers chapter 11, I have great hope. Oh, that all people would prophesy, would be prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit in them. I long for a day when our microchurches become a place where we regularly receive words from the Lord through others in our group. I hope for moments in these gatherings where God speaks directly to the intricacies of our life through another person. I desire for people in our workplaces, our neighborhoods, and our cities to come to know Jesus because we were brave enough to obey the nudge from the Holy Spirit. I eagerly desire the gifts of prophecy. And the question today is, do you? Do you? Worship team, if you want to join me. I'll never forget the first time that I heard and spoke a prophetic word to someone. It still brings like joy and tears every time I think about it. 
I was 20 years old, um, still in college. I had a really good friend who had been, um, like she lived below me, the floor below me the previous year. She had gotten married and moved to Colorado. And she texted me and was like, hey, let's jump on a phone call. And this wasn't out of the ordinary. She just moved there about a year ago. And so we would randomly catch up here and there. And so she texts me this. I'm like, yes, let's schedule a call. We schedule a call. And I just get this nagging sense like that something is very wrong. I don't know what. I don't know why. There was like nothing to give me a clue that something would be wrong. I think I even, okay, guys, I'm going to date myself. I hopped on Facebook because I don't know that people were really that much on Instagram yet. Maybe they were. I don't know. But I hopped on Facebook <laughs> and I'm like scouring her Facebook. Like, is there something wrong? Is there something going on? You know, can't find anything. Like, okay, what is this? I don't know. So right before we get on our call, I just take a few minutes uh, to pray. This wasn't long. This was like two minutes. I took two minutes to just say, okay, God, I'm feeling this sense. I don't know what this is. Is this something I just ate the night before? Like, what's going on? And as I'm praying, I have this unshakable impression that she's just had a miscarriage. I don't know why. It came out of left field. I didn't even know if her and her husband had been trying. They had been married almost a year, but not quite at that point. And I just remember thinking, like, this is crazy. Surely, like, I'm hearing this wrong. I'm getting a weird sense. But I remember telling the Lord, like, if you really want me to say something on our call, like, you're going to have to not just, like, create the opportunity for it, but you're going to have to just, like, force me to say it. Because I just, I don't know if I'm going to be brave enough. And so in that moment, I really doubt it. But I hopped on this call with her. And as soon as I jumped on the phone, I could just tell something was wrong. Like, she was trying to make it through, like, the normal way that you talk on the phone, right? When you hop on a call, like, hey, how are you? How's your day? And she's just struggling to, like, get words out. Um, and so I, I took a deep breath, and I asked, did you just have a miscarriage? And the other line went totally silent. And the words, idiot, 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 just like started going in my mind. And I'm thinking through like, how do I walk this back? This, what did I do? Why did I say that? And through tears, she began to sob and she said, how did you know that? And the only way my 20 year old self knew how to explain it was like, I think God told me. <laughs> That's all I got. See, it's one thing to know that God loves you intellectually, and it is a completely different one to be feel seen and loved by God. And in that moment, she intellectually knew that God loved her. But when I asked her that question, she felt so seen by him, so loved by him. She didn't have the answers to all of her questions. She didn't still understand why. I still don't think she does do any of that she knew in that moment, God really loves me. And this is why I think prophecy is worth it. Because it's the translation and communication of God's love to the people around us. Will you eagerly desire prophecy? Would you stand with me? I'm going to pray over us this morning. If you're feeling like the Holy Spirit might be speaking to you something something to you right now, or maybe you're really uncomfortable, um, maybe just as a sign of like openness or like I have no idea what to do right now, just put your hands out in front of you. It's an ancient posture of receiving, one that's been practiced by the saints for generations, and it just simply says, God, I I don't know everything, but I'm open to you. Jesus, we're open to you today. God, I'm frustrated that prophecy can be so messy, <laughs> that communication can be so difficult, that it can be used and weaponized in a way that's hurt maybe people even in this room. But God, I long for a day when people come to know you simply because we were obedient enough to communicate your love for them. Jesus, change 
change or transform something in our heart, remove the lens of skepticism that so often pervades our being. Open ourselves up to this gift that Paul tells us to so eagerly seek to build up, encourage, and love the people around us. May we be people who earnestly desire your gifts, especially that of prophecy. listening to the Midtown Church Weekly Podcast. To find out more or to join a church gathering, check out our website at midtownkc.church.